Here we go. Welcome everybody. We're, we're on to session number 10. And tonight's agenda, we'll have our start out with question and answers. We'll have weekly updates. We have three weekly updates, including from our foraging expert. Uh, just a couple announcements, and then we're going to talk about what, what people have in mind for their fall preparations. Michael, can I interrupt? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, because I can't, I have, I'm only connected by audio. I can hear you, you can hear me. I don't know what's wrong with my system. But anyway, I'll listen and talk if I need to. Huh, yeah. okay. Oh wait, so, uh, but I do wanna give, a, if you don't mind, Michael, like a, just a one or two minutes on the uh, dirt garden, uh, kitchen garden. So you let me know when you want me to say, talk about that for a minute. Why don't we do that during the announcements time? Okay, sounds good. So, gosh, um, somebody submitted these pictures. She had these beautiful tomatoes. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then the chipmunks came in. Yes. And uh, this is what it looks like afterwards. And she, she's not online with us tonight, but this was something that she came up with. Has anybody tried anything like this? Yeah, has anyone tried like a garlic or pepper solution to keep away chipmunks, squirrels, anything like that? Has anyone ever attempted that? Well, we have in the community garden, we have quite a bit of fencing. There is a wretched uh, chipmunk in there getting the lower, some of the lower tomatoes, which is normal. At home, I don't really grow vegetables at home, but the chipmunk's all over my deck and the dog chases it. I will tell you, Sunday, we had a really nice crop of peaches, so I brought some peaches home in one of those mesh bags along with the other produce and left it on the table, the deck table. I ran over to the farm market and I came back and it was the squirrel who oh. ate a hole through the mesh bag into my peaches and then the dog chased the squirrel off. So now I don't know if it's just chipmunks or chipmunks and squirrels. <laughs> They're, they're I, use, I know. I use I use a um, liquid fence around my yard. You can use it. It is vegetable safe. I, I mean, I wouldn't put it on tomatoes, but I have used it when beans and things like that are first coming up, and there's some critter in the garden. I have sprayed the beans with liquid fence to, so they could so, get big enough to survive. If you don't mind, what, what is liquid fence exactly? It's this stinky stuff you buy that's, you know, eggs and something else. You get it at the Waitsons and you use it on your flowers to keep from the deer destroying them. But it is, it is food safe. Okay. Liquid. But I mean, like I said, don't put it on your ripening tomatoes. <laughs> we, we had a bed this year where it seemed like nothing was growing there. And so I thought, well, okay, well, maybe we can plant some Jacob's cattle beans, which grow, seem to grow really well. And a chipmunk came on and dug them up and ate them. Ah, uh, okay. Now we're gonna try carrot seeds. And it, you know, it seemed like after we plant them, somebody went digging around trying to find what was there. So I don't know if carrots are gonna come up first or not later, or you know, we'll, we'll have to see. Now I had a few zucchini hills where I know is the deemed chipmunk because I plant them in hills with six and I go over and you can see the dirt's been fluffed around and the, and you know, the seeds are on top of the ground. You won't like this, Michael, but I've taken the hose and stuck it down the chipmunk hole and let it run for like half an hour and it didn't stop it. <laughs> <laughs> they get, you get a little crazy when they, uh, when they yeah. start, start eating your stuff. So I, I guess no one has used that uh, combination, so I don't know uh, if we could recommend it. I've seen that on a lot of uh, websites. It's different homemade sprays you can make to deter groundhogs, deer, etc. They're all based on rotten eggs, hot pepper, garlic, etc. Okay. Okay, let's um, 
So I guess we've discussed chipmunks and they're, that's the reason they're, um, anyway, they're a problem. Everyone agrees. Um, oops. I had a question about Malabar spinach. And, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and um, Chad, could you just tell us about your Malabar spinach and how this works? Yeah, I, I, again, it hasn't it's just starting to snake up. If you see in that first picture, it's uh, well, it, it seems like once it gets going, it goes pretty quickly. But again, that is, I have two things growing of spinach. It's taking a little bit of taking a little longer than last year to grow. But you know, once it gets going, I just snip. And it'll really spread out. It'll, it'll bind up, and you know I have like a um, kind of a chicken wire thing, and it'll spread out. And I, I think it's you know I love it. It tastes good, and then I get spinach all summer long. And you know it's, it's not a perennial, but it uh, I, you know I think it's a great replacement for spinach, which I always have trouble growing from seed, and it doesn't. And, and even though I do grow it, it bolts really quickly. So I do recommend that Malabar spinach. And, and, and it, it will really it go summer? Sorry? It will yeah, actually, it's heat resistant? Yes, it, it, hmm. it just seems to like the heat. Wow. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't believe, yeah, I think it's from tropical area. I don't think it's from here, hmm. so. Interesting. So yeah, you, started, a, you started well after the first frost or something. When do you start it? Yeah, you know, right after the first frost, which, you know, I probably put in a little early and you know, we got that little late frost. It was. It was definitely there, but it survived. But yeah, it's still still somewhat small, but it is it is it is growing, and now it's starting to really snake up. So hopefully it'll take off. Yeah, but it, it likes the sun and heat. And you started it from seed. You seeded directly. Right? No, no, no. Uh, transplant. Oh. I, I yeah I don't I, I got it from uh, Midsummer Farm. But uh, yeah, seeds. I, I guess I could order the seed packaging, but I I, I don't often see it. Jack, you want to tell us something about your irrigation? Uh, well, you know, you, with all the time Ginny spend, I really don't spend that much time in the garden other than, you know, I do the, the construction end of it or whatever, you know, whatever she needs moved. That's my end. What, you know, is growing in there. I know some of the stuff, not much, but, you know, watering has always been an issue and I've always wanted to do some kind of a, uh, a drip irrigation and a long time ago I asked you know Ginny you know if you look into it I'll build it and you know waiting waiting her watering me watering finally this year I had the time and you know I put the time into it and that's what I came up with what you're looking at and it's working good it's working good for you guys uh, so far, um, yeah, everything's been good. I have to put a, uh, you know, I wasn't sure how it was going to work and everything seems to be going, you know, working as planned. So I'm going to put a, uh, you know, a control box with a, you know, a three or four zone timer on it to, you know, take over so we don't have to go down, turn it on and off. Just not sure yet on, I have to figure out the calculations as to actually how much water we're actually, you know, putting into the garden. Thank you. Wow. Amazing. And, you know, it, it was really time consuming. I couldn't believe how much time, you know, it took to make all the manifolds and, you know, adding it all up, it, you know, it turned out to be, you know, a fair amount of money. All those fittings, I mean, there's a lot of fittings and, you know, a dollar twenty for one, a dollar forty for another, and then, you know, 20 raised beds, and it was like, holy cow. But the time you spend watering 20 raised beds is, holy cow. Yeah, hopefully right. In the long run, it'll save time. Steve. S S Steve sent in this picture of t potato problems. You want to pipe in there, Steve? I can't, I, can anyone else hear Steve? I can't hear him. No, but it looks like, it doesn't look like he's muted. Nope. But, hmm. 
maybe put some put something in the chat if you're having a, a technical issue. Um, I don't know, maybe we'll come back to that one. Does anyone have a? Yeah. Steve, raise your thumb if you can hear us. Oh, he's just logged off, I think. All right, sorry. Has, has anyone grown hardy kiwi? Right, why are you thinking about it? We got one kiwi vine that came with a fig tree that we bought and it's growing ginormous. You just can't stop these things. It's just that you're supposed to have both male and female. Uh, and I'm not sure what we got, but it's not, it's only worth thinking about doing more. Welcome back, Steve. We can't hear you again. Um, let me do this. I'm gonna. Yeah, you're not muted at all. Cool. Jeff, if you're still listening, your camera is not on. I'm not sure if that would make a difference, but your camera is not running, Jeff. I I can't figure out how to get my camera on. All I have. Oh. Jeff Howard left. <laughs> he he scared you, him away. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Hey, good. I had to restart yes. Zoom. Sorry about that. It's all right. Um, so, the, so the picture I showed uh, for anybody that grows potatoes, uh, this is kind of a common problem. I only seem to have it with one variety. And uh, I don't know if Michael or, or Chad, if you could bring that picture back up with the potato. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me share a screen again. I, I, I actually, uh, never mind. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. So I'll just keep talking. So what we what we are going to look at is a Yukon Gold potato, which is a short season potato. It's it's about 65 days, and what you see in the center is this hollow section, and it's it's called hollow heart, or there are other words for it, um, but uh, the harvest has been really good, but this is a typical problem you have with these potatoes. And what I've learned is it's typically caused by stress from either too much change in temperature or too much change in moisture. And we've had both of those this year where uh, we've gone from, you know, relatively cool in the spring when I first planted to suddenly super hot weather. Uh, what you wouldn't typically expect in potato growing areas like in the north. So we've also had very dry weather and then we've had long downpours. So that's what I attribute it to. It doesn't affect all of them uh, and, it, and you can cut out the bad parts, but it is a little bit of annoying and you won't really notice it until you've harvested. Um, so that's my, that was my potato problem. If anybody has that problem, that's what I've found is the solution. The solution is to regular water or to try to moderate the temperature, which we have no control over. Thank you. Yeah. And just one other thing on the potatoes. So I had three different varieties and um, these were, these I planted on the 15th of May and I harvested the first new potatoes on the 15th of July. So 60 days, which I thought was pretty good. And I had a uh, couple of really nice potatoes, and then I've left them for the last, you know, almost two weeks, and now I started harvesting today. And again, when you, sorry, when you pick a tomato, do you also let it uh, sit for a while before you use it, kind of like garlic or? Uh, no, today, today I just harvested some. I dug them out at, at five o'clock, and they were in our supper at seven. <laughs> okay, there you go. No, they were, they were, they were great. I, mean, I think it's been, a, for me anyway, it's been a very good year for potatoes. No, no problem with potato beetles. And, uh, you know, other than this, this little bit of a problem, I also harvested some of uh, my Kennebecs, which are white potatoes. They're not really going to be finished for another two weeks, but they were beautiful and good and solid. And so I think it's going to be a great yield. You know, I, I, I personally am a anything but Yukon Gold potato kind of guy. <laughs> Yukon Gold is the potato that McDonald's has grown for uh, French fries, right? So something like 95% uh, of the potato crop yeah. is, is Yukon Gold. So to my, 
to my mind, if I'm going to grow a potato and I like to grow them and I've got them growing, anything but Yukon Gold is great. <laughs> so to, to your point, Michael, so my experience is that Yukon, the reason I grow Yukon Gold is because they're an early potato. So there aren't too many varieties that you could harvest after 60 days. Um, and that's, that's great here. It's, it makes a big difference further north. But um, I have a lot of, I've spent a lot of time in uh, Canada uh, in potato growing area. And typically they grow a totally different potato, which one year I brought back, it was called a shepherdy. And you could reliably grow seven to nine inch potatoes. And they were just beautiful, huge, heavy potatoes. And they almost exclusively supply the McDonald's uh, franchise. So it's interesting. Um, I didn't know that they use Yukon Golds. They may. But I know that uh, shepherdies from uh, from New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island are principally sent down to the U.S. for uh, McDonald's. That's interesting. Maybe my source was wrong, and I remember I forget where I read that. So maybe my maybe my memory has mixed that up. No, yeah, who knows? Could be both. If I read it, I possibly read it in uh, something written by uh, um, Michael Pollan. Or I'm thinking of might have heard that. Maybe Hamnivore's Dilemma or someplace. Hmm. Okay. So you owe, you owe the Yukon Gold an apology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to investigate whether I need to apologize or not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have weekly updates. Um, we're going to have, uh, why don't we go from right to left on this screen? So, Alexander, do you want to tell us about what you got? Do you, you want to share your screen on this? Yes, I would love that. Okay, Thank you. so I've got to click another button here. Can you screen share now? Uh, it looks like it is allowing me, yes. Okay, um, so before I do that, um, actually I'll just start it and then we can just go through it. All right, so the plants I wanna talk about today um, so I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but um, I'm an herbalist and I mainly work in the wise woman tradition, which basically means that I work with plants that are, you know, available locally around us, that grow around us. So I grow weeds and medicinal herbs. And um, whenever I find a patch of food that I really love working with and enjoy, I go there over and over again or I try to encourage it to grow in my yard. So um, this is one of the plants that um, I found growing in my yard when I first moved here. And um, it's lamb's quarters. And this is in the um, goosefoot family, which also includes um, things like beets and spinach. And there's lots of different species that we can refer to as, as lamb's quarters. Um, but this one I'll be talking about is particularly uh, the Chemopodium album, and I'll tell you why um, album, which means um, white, comes into play. But this is probably the most um, available one that you'll see growing everywhere. So really accessible. You'll see grow, grow um, on the roadsides, uh, in disturbed soil. It really likes shady areas. And you can really encourage, encourage it to grow in your backyard as well. Uh, the chipmunks do not like it. So there's no issues with squirrels <laughs> or chipmunks. The deer love it. So I do have um, a deer net around mine, just in case. Actually, they just ate. Um, one, one of them was like three feet tall um, this year, and the deer already ate it. So, um, so anyway. Um, there is different accounts of whether or not it's a native species, but what they found is that there is uh, a native species that was cultivated here uh, for thousands of years before the settlers came. And of course, there is the local South American variety, which we still cultivate, which is quinoa, um, the seeds um, uh, of that plant. And so it's been around here for a long time. There's also the European variety that was then brought in and kind of mixed in with the native species. Uh, but the way to identify this plant, um, so it's a plant that's about one to three feet tall, um, leaves are alternate, and you'll start seeing that as the plant starts growing. It has these feet that looks like geese feet. So they're 
kind of irregularly toothed. They have some lobes. I have a picture here of the leaf. And you'll see that the petiole, so the leaf stem, is pretty much as large as the leaf itself. Um, and the stems are not hairy. They're pretty smooth. They're ridged. And in a lot of um, lamb quarters plants, you will see there's kind of like a red ridge. Or you will see what I have here in the picture, uh, in the lower picture here, this little tinted tint of red. I don't know if you can tell. Um, it's reddish here, right, where the leaf uh, meets the stem. So that's a really sure way to identify this plant. Um, the leaves are like very soft and flimsy, so you'll find yourself really harvesting a lot of it uh, if you want to make a meal with it. Just like spinach, you know, it will it will look like nothing <laughs> once you're done, but it's really really, really delicious. Um, and this is kind of put in album because um, it has this white powder underneath the leaves, and you can see some of it here, also some of it on the stem. Um, and on some of these leaves here, and also on this one. Um, this powder is what you really are, why you're cooking it, when you're eating it. So this powder is not really tasty, it's very metallic. Um, so it's really what we wanna get rid of um, and why we're cooking this plant. Um, when, when I like to cook it, I like to cook all my vegetables for up to an hour to really break the cell walls to access all of the vitamins and minerals. This is a plant that is packed with vitamins and minerals. Uh, it's really high in vitamin C uh, and keratones, so vitamin A, iron, calcium, potassium. It also has a very um, high amount of protein. So you can harvest the leaves. The tops are really, really delicious. You can harvest them from the spring up until now, obviously to keep harvesting them. Um, you'll still get those like nice tender tops uh, all through the all through the summer, and once it grows the seed, so uh, it flowers around this time, maybe a month from now. It has these tiny little green flowers. It's an annual, uh, you know, not a very evolved plant. <laughs> it self seeds. Um, so maybe if if you find a patch, just let it seed the first year, and the seeds are kind of like brown. Uh, brown, black, if you are planning on harvesting the seeds and then planting them somewhere else, the brown ones are much easier, um, much easier to work with than the black ones, as in my experience and also what I have, uh, what I have read in some other, uh, whatever sources. The seeds are also really delici delicious. You have to remove um, the husk because otherwise um, it's, it's edible but you won't be able to break it down. So you're not really accessing any of the nutritious oils instead of the, instead of the seed. But the seeds are also really delicious. Um, so yes, yeah, so I love working with this plant. I love um, cooking it up, adding in some lemon or eating it with a stew. If you read about um, the Native American uses of this plant, you'll find that, you know, almost um, every, you know, native um, tribes in this area have this as, as part of the staple diet. There's some medicinal uses of the root um, that mostly have to do with stomach problems and things like uh, indigestion and diarrhea, but there's much better and more interesting, um, you know, plants for that. So that's the first one I want to talk about, and I want to open up for any questions, if anyone has any, or anything to add, if you have any experience with this plant, or any stories. We, a friend gave us some seeds for, um, I, I, I once referred to them as pink lamb's quarters, and he said, no, they're magenta. And they're sometimes referred to as magenta spring. Mm -hmm. um, and we eat them all the time. And I once shared them with my primary care physician. And the next time I went there, she came into the room and, and I thought I'd done something wrong. But she, she, but actually she had been growing these. She even grows them inside and eats them and loves them. So. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. Alexander, I have a question. Um, yeah. I have, I've, I've used lamb's quarters uh, I just find them wild in my garden area. 
Mm -hmm. And this year, for whatever reason, I haven't found any. Is this a particularly problem this year because it's so hot or is there a reason why I haven't seen them? Yeah, they don't really like the heat. Um, so if it's in, um, in a very sunny spot, yeah. they, it's not really a preferred area. Um, I know this because I tried planting my in a pot um, on my patio where it's always sunny. It's facing southeast, so it's pretty much, you know, from, from morning into, yeah. uh, into the afternoon. But the patch that is really, really thriving is under a bunch of spruce trees. Mm. And so it's kind of like a mix of sun and shade. And the soil there is also, it's not great quality soil. Um, it definitely drains, drains pretty well. And, and you'll see that, you know, I didn't really take good pictures because the plants were so wilted, um, you know, for the past two days that it just, it kind of like broke my heart <laughs> to, um, you know, to be harvesting them. But earlier in the, in, in the year, um, they were, yeah, they looked, they looked much, much livelier. Okay, well, thank you. I'll, I'll go foraging in some shadier areas. Maybe I'll find some. Yeah, but they're pretty easy to grow. Yeah, okay. I've yeah. never grown them. I've always just foraged them wild. Yeah, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and the second plant, this is mostly just for fun, um, because we could be medicinally talking about this plant for a very long time, um, but Queen's Anne's Lace is blooming now, which always indicates for me that Summer is almost over. Once Queen's Anne's Lace comes and Golden Rod comes and then it's pretty much September. Um, so we went, when was this last week? And we harvested, I would say, you know, the basket I have pictured here is like, you know, as big as like my, my arms, like making a circle. It's a very large basket um, of Queen's Anne's Lace, so just the flowering tops. And this plant is, and they're really interesting family because you know it has really a mix of very poisonous plants and also very nutritious and delicious plants. Um, so this is Dacus carota, and it's an APAC family. Uh, it's also the umbel family. So a lot of the plants in this family have umbels. So that's the best way to identify them, and they all look very similar. So part of the reason I'm really describing the leaves here, although Queen's Anne's Lace leaves do look very much like carrot leaves, um, it is, look at the leaves of this family is not the surest way not to be eating something that is going to either create heat slash sun sensitivity or, or kill you. Uh, there's not much poison hemlock in this area, uh, not much water hemlock, but there is, um, a ton of um, well parsnip, which is you know it gives people some sensitivity to the sun, uh, and there's also tons of other plants that look very similar. But the most the easiest way to identify identify Queen's Anne's lace is that some of the flowers will have this one um, purple flower in the middle. And that's also why they say that um, Queen Anne said that she wanted to have a garment made that was as delicate at the Queen's as this Queen Anne's lace, Anne's lace flowers. And when um, the garment was made, someone pricked their finger and there was a drop of blood on the, on the lace. So that's why the name came from. Um, and this flower, we have no idea why it shows up. Uh, but she's present in most plants, um, light purple or dark purple. It's really interesting because this flower can actually tell you how fresh the plant is. So when she's really fresh, um, it, will be, it will be this color. So you'll, you can tell it's actually purple. And then um, when the plant you know, is aging a little bit, it will turn a dark purple. So I like to harvest it when it's at its sweetest and when it's at this kind of lighter, lighter purple before it gets like black. And I love working with this plant because oh, the other way to identify it is that it smells like carrots. It's a very sweet smelling plant. Every part of the plant you can crush it between your fingers and smell it. Um, so you can really tell whether it's Queen's Lace or something else. Um, so I love making wine from the flowers because you can really preserve that sweetness. And it's pretty easy to do. All you have to do is just harvest a bunch of flowers, 
I don't really measure things uh, unless I'm making things like infusions. But for this, I use a, a gallon jar and I make sure I can just fit all the flowers in there. And that's pretty much my measurement. And then um, I boil water. I add the flowers to the water facing down and just leave them in there for about eight hours, almost like an infusion of fresh flowers. And after that, I add some, some sugar, so about a pound of sugar, a little bit of lemon, um, so that uh, it can stay semi-stable until the yeast starts working. And then you can add some white wine yeast. Some flowers, um, like elderflowers we were talking about last week, do have some natural yeast on them. Queen's Anne's Lace also does. So sometimes you don't even need to add yeast, you can add a little bit of vinegar. Um, and you get some really nice results. And then, so you add the yeast and you let it sit in an airlock, um, airlock container for two to four weeks. Try tasting it once in a while. And then you can add sugar if you want it sweeter, depending on you know, how fast the yeast, the yeast is, is eating up the sugar. Um, yes, yeah, so I make this every year. I really love it. Historically, the medicinal uses of this plant um, have mostly been from the seeds. The, the seeds were used as a contraceptive. Um, there's also, it's one of those plants where you really have to work with it for a long time uh, to figure out its medicinal uses because the root of the plant can actually do the opposite. It encourages, it encourages fertility. Um, so, and also I wanted to mention that, you know, in a lot of books, they say that um, Daucus carota is either, you know, the predecessor to our cultivated carrot or vice versa. In my research, I have actually found there are two separate species. Um, you know, the cultivated carrot comes from a totally different um, species in the APC family, but they do, you know, smell, smell the same. And you can also add the flowers to your salad. And they're very high in potassium and very delicious and very sweet. Uh, just make sure that you cut off the stem and just have like, the little flowers in your head because the stems are not really palatable. They're very tough. So I usually just like snip off the stem and just add the, the smaller flowers um, to my salad. Um, so yeah, that's what I have for today. I hope that this was, um, this gives an idea of what you can do um, during these weeks while these plants are still out and blooming. Anybody has any questions? Mm -hmm. Happy to answer. Or stories. Stories are always good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm going to stop sharing. Wow. Thank you so much, Alexandra. You're welcome. Um, Jeff is there. He's back. And, and not only is he, is he back, um, but uh, he has a head behind him. But let's go turn next to Steve for his for his review. What's going on in his garden this week? Uh, so I, I sent a couple of pictures. I don't know if you've got them. Uh, they're not really um, essential. Uh, I'll just do a quick run through squash. We've got lots of squash, um, particularly uh, the winter squash are doing really well. Acorn squash are are full full size and um, butternut squash are getting there, but uh, I planted them a little bit later. Um, so I'm looking, I'm looking to have a lot of acorn squash this winter. Um, beans, lots of beans, picking and freezing beans every couple of days. My peas just finished. Uh, I planted the peas the first week of April and, um, and I've had pretty consistent um, peas until just uh, really the last week. My corn is five feet tall, approximately. Um, I use a soaker hose up and down the rows to keep it uh, hydrated. Uh, harvested garlic. Um, I didn't plant as much last year because I wasn't really sure I'd be here this summer, but uh, I do have garlic. Um, I started, I've been starting new seedlings of greens with um, collards and uh, kale and a about every couple of weeks, I'm putting in another row of spinach, uh, excuse me, of uh, lettuce. No spinach, too hot for spinach. Um, Swiss chard, I planted Swiss chard late. 
So I usually plant that late in the season. I planted it about three or four weeks ago and the plants are about six to eight inches high. So I'll start harvesting that in the next few weeks and be able to keep that all the way through frost. Potatoes, we already spoke about. I, I have, uh, I'm just about to start harvesting potatoes. I've got lots of herbs. Um, I'm drying herbs and using them fresh. And um, that's about it. I just wanted to say one thing about compost. A month or two ago, we were talking about compost and somebody had a question about how long does it take ideally to finish your compost. And um, I just dumped out, I have a big um, uh, tumbler and I've just dumped it for the third time since the beginning of the season. So I figure every seven to eight weeks, I'm able to turn out a, a pretty good pile of compost. And not everything is finished, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll run it through a screen and throw all the big pieces back in with some of the old compost. And I use a little bit of kelp meal, maybe a, a pound or two of kelp meal with each batch of, of compost to help it get moving. So that's my story for the week. When you freeze Thank beans, you. how do you freeze them? I'm sorry, which? When you freeze beans, what do you, what do, you do? Do you just take, put the whole bean in the freezer, or what do you do? I, I blanch them two minutes to three minutes, depending on size, and then a quick splash in ice water bath, and then I put them into freezer bags and, and put them right in the freezer. Thanks. Um, let's see. So I think we're going to have Sarah next. Um, but I'm going to share my screen because she sent some pictures of the community garden. Uh, Sarah, you're on mute. I wanted to show you, and Jeff can uh, hop in on this. We got a really late start. Somewhere in here, there's a slide of, of May when most people have their garden going, and we had a row of a few pieces of spinach, I think. It was a very difficult year. Uh, but I'm sorry, hmm? so I only got three pictures, these pictures that we've seen, so. Oh, okay, then I don't know where that one went. <laughs> but anyway, you could get the idea. We have you know raised beds and some open beds. And because of the uh, COVID shutdown, we really didn't get to start seriously gardening until around the end of May. And even then we were restricted to the number of people in the garden. But as you can see, we have won the battle and everything is really, really popping now. This was taken two weeks ago. We started harvesting beans and on Sunday, last Sunday, I think we got like a half of a um, those roaster pans you buy for a turkey. We maybe had a half a pan. Tuesday we got a full pan and this last Sunday we had three pans. <laughs> and what we're doing is we on purpose are growing very basic crops this year and we're giving a surplus to the food pantry. In fact we've had to increase our number of work sessions normally in the summer we have a Sunday morning and a Tuesday evening, and now we've added Friday morning to harvest because there's, you know, there's enough produce. The zucchinis are doing well. I'm big on letting things self-seed. You can see, it's hard to tell, but there's all kinds of dill floating around there. I haven't planted dill from seed for years. In fact, we had to throw some of it out, but it's great. It, it comes up, you know, use tons of it to use, then there's always more that, that seeds. There's some Brussels sprouts in there growing, which I hope they're Brussels sprouts. I had a master gardener grow them and they keep looking like cabbage, but we'll see. And the tomatoes are about to really explode. We really went big on tomatoes this year. I put in 60 plants. Um, they're coming on strong. And that, you know, is the most exciting part of gardening for me is the uh, tomatoes. And then there's a, a picture in here with someone bending down, Michael. Those are tomatoes, aha. This is to tell you all that the squash bugs are out in force. We have always had a squash bug problem in this garden. And through diligent, what we call, um, 
hand, you know, it's just basically hand picking and soaping water. We've really had them under control, but this year the little devils are out pretty thick. So, so far there's only been one adult and there's a lot of the little eggs. So we send people out to go through the, the leaves and scrape those nasty little eggs off. And I had a question, has anyone ever seen white squash eggs? Usually they're red. No. So I'm not sure what these eggs, uh, white eggs are. But um, I just wanted to show you that our garden is really flourishing despite all the setbacks we've had. And it's a good year because like, people usually lose interest right now, but so many people aren't taking vacations. That has become a very popular pastime. <laughs> Jeff, do you have anything to throw in? Yes, not. So anyway, that's just one to give you a little idea of what we do. Okay, well, let's see. We don't have that many announcements this week. Um, although everyone knows the local forest map is live. You can, if you want to, if there's some local food you want to get, or as much as you can, whatever you, is isn't growing in your garden, go to the Sustainable Warwick website and on the front page, you'll see a link to the local boars map. And our Nicole Hickson, who's usually on our garden Zoom, she got third in the uh, dirt garden tour, which was yesterday. Congratulations, was it yesterday or Saturday, probably? Yesterday. So congratulations, yesterday. Nicole. And I mentioned this last week, but um, greenamerica.org, they've got a victory garden. You can sign up, you can register your garden, and you can get a free organic cotton t-shirt for signing up. Um, and they'll send you things about making your, uh, helping your garden capture a little bit more carbon. Um, does anybody have any other announcements that they'd like to make just now? I just have a question. <clears throat> uh, Sarah, when you were talking about the, the white eggs, um, mm -hmm. I do notice a lot of uh, clusters of white eggs from the uh, cabbage moth. And I just wonder if you have cabbage moths. Those are the, yes. the yes. white and yellow oh, moths yes. that you see. I'm very familiar with cabbage moss. Yeah. Okay. Then that must be what it is because they're in the same little tight formation that yeah. the squash bug eggs are in. Yeah. Well, could be. I'm going to go get rid of those. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Michael, I just want to say I know we're running a little short on time. Uh, yeah, I, you know, the garden uh, tour was great, the kitchen garden tour. Brendan. Uh, Wagner was in there as well. We gave a presentation and Sean Downs who attends uh, some of these workshops also participated. And real quick, maybe we could even get into it more another time. But uh, I went to Meadowburn Farm, I guess Jesse Clark and uh, nonchalant cheese. It was it was pretty amazing watching she she her garden she went against every every rule I ever thought was a rule like she plants old seeds that have expired. She doesn't thin. She doesn't thin the seeds at all. I wish I, sh I should have taken a picture. She doesn't weed and she doesn't water them. And she had a beautiful, full garden. I was like in disbelief. It was pretty interesting. Her, her, you know, like all those things I thought were quite necessary that she has not watered them, and even in this heat, and and things are really flourishing. So it's, it's interesting to see different styles and and philosophies. What are some of the What are some of the uh, crops that she was growing, Chad? She had beets, she had, uh, you know, greens, she had corn, you know, like all the uh, tomatoes, all the basic stuff. I, I, I couldn't, I kept on, I'm like, what? You, you have, <laughs> I couldn't believe. That's great. She, she, she doesn't thin them at all. She says even when the small, you know, when the bigger ones come up, she, that, you know, she pulls them and the small ones are filling the space. So I, I really should have taken a picture, but uh, I did not. That's great. But it was very, it was very interesting. Maybe we'll get her to speak one time at one of these, uh, garden zooms you know i'll tell you chad this whole expired seed thing is more of a seed uh catalog marketing ploy i use i uh. keep the seeds i don't throw them out and this year i did not buy seeds because at the time that 
I usually order seeds to seed companies shut down to everyone but major growers. And then it became, are we going to have a garden or aren't we going to have a garden? So I had a stockpile of seeds and someone gave the community garden a number of seeds last year from a store that went out of business. And then we bought some plants. So all those beans, the greens, everything came from seeds from the last two years, not brand new seeds. And I also don't thin greens. Plant them, throw them in thick, because most of the people who plant aren't that great at planting, quite honestly. And then we just pull, you know, pull the thin, the small ones out and eat them and move on. Beets are the only thing I rearrange. Everything else, let her go. <laughs> I second so I guess, that. Similar. All right. Yeah, I second that, Sarah. Um, I, I've used seeds as far as two years old. Oh, and yeah. When I have leftovers at the end of the year, I put them into Ziploc bags and just try, go for them the next year. Yeah. I keep them in, I have a mud room that has a dog door in it. So, you know, it's, it's not freezing, but it's much cooler than the rest of the house. So I put the seeds in there in something that's, you know, mouse proof because, you know, it's winter. And I store them in that cool location, and you can use them for several years. Yeah. I plant them thick when they're getting old. <laughs> Is it a bad idea to put them in the refrigerator if you don't have a cool place? I read quite a bit about that last winter, and there seemed to be a couple schools of thought. Depending on how many seeds you have, it does take up a lot of room. Uh, people prefer putting them, you have to be very dry, put them in paper, and then they're better stored in glass or plastic. And I thought about buying a mini refrigerator for this, and then I said, oh well, and I've continued with my jars and plastic bags and whatnot, and they're just fine. But if they get really hot, that degrades the seeds. And don't let them get damp. <laughs> Folks, we only have nine minutes left. Do we want to shimmy in place or do we just want to keep persevering through the discussion of how we're preparing for fall? I guess we'll, uh, I guess I'll hold off on the shimmy this, this time. Sorry. There we go. Yeah. So um, what do people do? What, you know, as far as getting ready for fall, what, what do people have in mind for that sort of thing? This was a recommended subject. We didn't really get a speaker on it. What are your thoughts, people? I mean, if you want to grow, um, I direct seed things like beets, and I we put some in a couple of weeks ago, but it takes a lot of, of water, and the garden's not in anyone's backyard, so some of them came up, but I'll put in beets maybe in September, you know, late August, September, when, it, when the rains hopefully come back, and it's easy to get another crop of beets. A lot of times you can get a crop of carrots, but I direct seed all that. Um, the greens at this point, I would start in, so, you know, start at home because it's too hot to grow most of the uh, cat, you know, uh, kales, bok choys, chard, all that. I would start them and, and plant them out. And I might try broccoli again. Broccoli is always taken over by the dreaded cabbage moss, so maybe I'll get brave. <laughs> I, I, I always plant carrots this time of year, and um, this is the first year that I'm planting uh, the squash, yellow squash and zucchini, uh, which are going to go in the ground in another two weeks, and uh, hopefully we'll beat some of the squash bugs. But I agree, uh, beets and carrots are great because they'll uh, you can harvest them right through the winter if you mm -hmm. if you cover them up. I'm going to put some fennel in in a bit also. Fennel will grow pretty. Mm. You can get a fennel crop in now, I think. We just uh, we're, we've been talking about beets and carrots, so that's that's a go. And we just put in some other uh, squash plants because we were having a problem with some squash spores. So we yeah. put uh, we put some nematodes down. And it seemed to solve some of the problems, um, but now now we're putting in more squash plants to try to beat that particular problem. 
Hmm. And that's, I guess that's in the soil and the nematodes help that. It's a little, it's a little above my pay grade. Um, <laughs> and hoping, hoping our chart is in, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's going, but it's not going as strong as I would like yet. But, you know, it's been, it's been hot, you know, and you got to stay on top of the watering. On a side note, my pepper plants are rocking right now. That's a whole different story. I put the turd yep. in the spring and let them get well established and then um, put shade cloth over them. And the chard, if you just do light harvesting with the leaves, it'll keep growing. I've kept chard going all summer. Okay. So same with kale. I can keep it going all summer. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Noted. Anybody planting peas for the fall? Thinking about it. Yeah, me too. I've, I've got another bag, bag and a half of peas, and I just don't want to waste it. And uh, so I may just throw it in and see what happens, keep it well watered, and hope it doesn't right. get too hot. Our spring crop was, was a disaster. We weren't there to pay any attention to it and fill in the ones that didn't come up. Hmm. So I'm with you. I have a nice bag of peas, and I think as soon as it cools off a wee bit, I'm going to put those in. Good. So when exactly would you throw those peas in? I'm, I'm going to do it in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Let it, let, let it cool off as much as it can and then, and then go for it. Right. Well, keep it, keep it really watered too. That's the main thing. Keep them yeah. hydrated. Right. Water's a big problem this time of year. Right. I started with a, with a, um, a drip hose, we started using a drip hose and then it just, it, it wasn't, it wasn't even enough distribution. Mm -hmm. um, so we went back to manually watering and, and, and we seem to be doing okay. We got a little bit of bottom rot on the tomatoes that we, so we started putting calcium on the, on the plants. Hmm. What well, I suggest on the tomatoes is straw. I put straw on the beds when the plants are young and that helps the splash back. Right. And the, the uh, tomatoes that are lying low, it keeps them off the ground. Right. We have all ours trestled up. I mean, gorgeous trestles and we right. have straw down. I'm not sure exactly why that occurred. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, gorgeously trestled. Well, Garrett, um, I'm only a few blocks away, and, and I'm sure I'm going to have way more tomatoes than I need very, very shortly. So you, yeah. you'll know where to get some. Thank you. That sounds great, Steve. Uh, so we're down to our last few minutes here. Ch Chad, are there... What if we, before we leave tonight, if we decide on the topic we want to discuss next week, what are some of the things, do you have a list in front of you still, or, or, or is, is there anybody who just wants to throw in a topic that they, they think is good for, it'll be the middle of August. You're on mute, Chad. Can't hear you. Sorry, we had organic uh, pest control, organic fertilizers, uh, different planting times to help fight insect disease, uh, watering. That's, that's all I had for the, and then we had, you know, the fall prep, which I guess we're kind of going into now. I don't know uh, if there's any type, yeah, I guess we could, we could, we didn't really discuss prep. Do you guys do any type of prepping as far as, right, like uh, when you add, do you like put down more mulch or do you add another layer of compost for the, you know, for the winter comes? I guess we could probably do that a little later in the season, but that'd be interesting to see how people, I would call that, that a prep or something or end yeah, of season. Right. Yeah, that would be interesting mm -hmm. yeah. near the end of the season. But any other topics you guys have in mind that you'd like to uh, go over? Did I miss uh, a, a session on organic pest control? No. Oh, uh, I, I, I'd, be, I'd be interested in that. Um, not that I have much to, I mean, much to add. Like, we, like the, nematode, the nematode thing was new to me, but I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if I should take the chickens out and put them in the garden a little bit and see if they eat the bugs or not, or, I mean, I don't even know, you know. 
They the will. Problem with chickens, uh, my experience with chickens was they did more damage uh, by tearing up the roots. Okay. Because they scratch. So just, yeah, you know, I mean, you, you could put them in a corn corn field, but um, I'd be careful around some of your more delicate crops. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. So you want to do uh, organic fertilizers next time, Michael? Did, did he say organic pest control? Was that what he was Oh, yeah, pest, sorry, pest control. Yeah, if, I mean, if there's anybody that knows anything about that. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll search for uh, yeah. information and uh, experts. We can always have a uh, recap of our favorite pests of the summer. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good, too. I mean, just identification <laughs> alone is a struggle. We could take a picture of our favorite squirrel and chipmunk and groundhog and uh yeah. <laughs> I got a groundhog, he's starting to make headway. So Let's see how that goes. A friend a friend was starting a garden a couple of years ago and it was later in the year and I said, Well something about you must have a lot of good, you know, produce this time. She said all she had was groundhog turds. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And on that note. <laughs> yeah, right? Put on punch. So thanks everyone for joining us and we'll be back in two weeks. Be sure to bring your friends. We'll Thank you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.